This is Pastor Gabriel Swagger, and welcome once again to another episode of our Crossfire Youth Services. As you can see, the services that we are going to be bringing you is a little bit different than what you would call a normal youth service. And the reason why it's different is simply because we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We teach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We sing Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I want you to sit back, enjoy yourself, and I believe that the message we're going to bring you today is anointed by the Holy Spirit. It will be a blessing to your heart and life. So sit back and enjoy the program.
Romans chapter 6, beginning, verse, beginning at verse number 19. We're going to read all the way down to the end of this chapter, and then the next time we'll be able to deal with the seventh chapter of Romans, the Lord willing. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse, no, uh, verse 19, Paul would say, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, you know, this, 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 that is, that should just make every one of us just get happy in this place. Because in verses 19, 20, and 21, that's what we used to be. But verses 22, it changes with two words, but now. Boy, my Lord, my Lord, I'm just going to stay here just for a moment on that. Look at what you used to be, but now. Satan can say, this is what you used to do, but you can say, devil, but now. You can look at your friends and say, that's what you used to do, but you can say, friend, but now. But now. But now. My, but now. I'm no longer a slave to unrighteousness. But now. But now. But now. But now. I'm a servant. Of Almighty God. Mm, glory to God. I tell you, that should just make you shout and happy right now. But now. Devil, I'm not no longer bound by sin. But now, I am bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm, but now. Being made free from sin. And become servants to God. You have your fruit under holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to use for a subject, preaching just for, a, if I can. I don't know if I'm, I might not get too much farther out from but now. But if we are going to get past but now. I want to deal with the fruit of sin and the fruit of holiness. But now. Boy, my, that's powerful right there. But now. Just think back at what you used to be like. Just think back at the past that was behind you. And just think at times that Satan will bring up your past against you. I, I, want, I want you to think about this. In the court of law, Satan is accusing you of everything under the sun of what you used to be. But when he approaches God the Father and says, this is what he used to be, God the Father looks at Jesus Christ and says, but now, but now, I don't see the failure and I don't see the sin. I just see the blood of Almighty, of Almighty God. I see the blood of Jesus Christ. Washing and cleansing from every stain. But now, glory to God. Somebody ought to give God praise in the house tonight. This should make you happy. Devil, but now. Devil, but now. Devil, but now. I'm no longer those things. But I've got fruit that leads to holiness. Let's deal with that if we can. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you would take over this church service tonight. Lord, move in this place one more time. Anoint us to minister, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Devil, I want you to hear this one more time. I used to be bound by sin. I used to have chains so thick. That could grip me that I could not shake them. I used to be burdened by my past. But now. But now things have changed. 
I'm no longer bound by sin, but I'm bound by Jesus Christ. I've shaken off those heavy bands, and I'm lifting up those holy hands right now. But now, as we have dealt with here in the last, I don't know, six months, dealing with the sixth chapter of Romans, however long it has been, I, I, I can't, I don't know about you, but this is just, it's, it, this has done something for me. Just studying this chapter over again, trying to get it into my spirit, it has done something to me. It's changed me because the Word of God changes people. The cross changes people. In this sixth chapter, just to recap, we begin, in essence, with our justification process. We deal with what the cross does to the unbeliever. That your past has been crucified with Christ. That your old man has been crucified in Christ. It has been buried with Christ. It has been completely put in a tomb never to be brought back up again. And a new man has been resurrected. A new woman has been resurrected. A new person has come to life where you have stripped off the old man and put on the new man. But I want you to to see something here tonight, that the cross was not just meant for the unbeliever. It was meant for the believer as well. Because we begin in the 12th verse and we we go from the justification process to the sanctification process. We come in by faith. In Christ, who He is and what He's done for the justification process. We can't come in to that process any other way. We cannot enter in to this process of justification by mere works. By good deeds. By believing in traditions. By money. By power. By fame. We cannot enter into this process with any other means with the exception of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God works on the basis of faith. He could have chosen any number of ways to work in the heart of man, but He chose the manner of faith to do it. You see, faith is simply believing. It's an action word. There is something attached to that. When you believe something, it works in you. When you believe something, it changes you. When you believe something, it changes your outlook. When you believe in Jesus Christ, it changes your whole world. And all it takes just to enter into this process, you don't have to jump through about 900 hoops. You don't have to read the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to be baptized in water. I want everybody to be baptized in water, but that's not going to save you. Speaking with tongues won't save you. The only thing that will save you is just accepting Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done for your heart and life. Allowing the blood of Jesus to be applied to the doorpost of your heart. That way you can enter into this process by faith. But you see, most Christians, we all believe that. But many Christians fail to avail themselves of the power of the cross in regards to sanctification. We believe that once we get in, we now have to leave the cross and go on to other, bigger, better things. The Holy Spirit tells us, once you get there, park there. Once you get to the cross, don't leave it. Once you get to the cross, don't move away from it, but stay there. Because the same way that we got in is the same way we stay in. We can only stay in as we stay. We got in by faith. We stay in by faith. But we must stay in by faith in Christ and Him crucified. We can't stay in any other way. Likewise, we can't be saved through works. We can't be sanctified through works. 
You can't be sanctified with standing out on Blue Bonnet Boulevard in the middle of July, handing out bottles of water. That's not going to sanctify you. It's a good deed, but it's not going to sanctify you. You could go to your neighbor's yard that got hit by this last monsoon that we had just a few days ago. I mean, my Lord, y'all saw it. It started out just like any other day. But about 9 o'clock, it went pitch black. And I mean, where we were in the office, the lights flickered and went out. The generator kicked on. And my wife and Caroline were huddled into our laundry room. And the dogs were outside. And I said, honey, get the dogs inside. They might fly away. She got them inside. And they stayed right in the back, the back door and just stayed there, hunkered down with each other. And I mean, it was a mess. Leaves blown off, tre- trees blown off, and all sorts of no- nonsense. You can go to your neighbor's yard and clean that yard, but it's not going to sanctify you. I hate to burst your bubble. But no amount of works will sanctify the believer. As we came in through faith, Paul tries to tell us through the Holy Spirit, we stay in by faith. We came in, even though we didn't know much about the cross, we knew that Jesus died for us, and that's how we came in. Likewise, knowing the same thing is how we stay in. Jesus died for me, and I believe that what he did was enough. Now, we get to this last portion of Scripture. And Paul addresses two things that stuck out at me whenever... I had prepared this message a couple of weeks ago and, of course, was not able to minister it. And going over it as I have all week, just this morning, I don't know why it happened this way, but studying Monday and Tuesday, I didn't see it. But this morning, when I got to the office and the first thing I did was begin to look over my notes to prepare myself. These two things immediately just leapt off the page at me. And Paul would address it, and I'll I'll address it. Let's look one real quick at verse number 20, uh, verse number 19. Actually, let's go to verse number 21. 21. Paul would say, What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? Speaking of the fruit of sin. And then in verse 22... He deals with, you have your fruit unto holiness. Those two things just leapt off the page at me. And I begin to look at what these two, these contrasting views and these contrasting fruits, if you will, where they will lead to. And it's all found in verses 19 through 23. Let's look at the fruit of sin. As we deal with this, understand that we're not dealing with just the unbeliever when it comes to the fruit of sin. We're coming to the believer as well. When it comes to sin, we're looking at both the unsaved and the saved. The first, if you will, fruit of sin, where it leads us to. The first place it leads us to is uncleanliness and iniquity. Verse 19 bears this out. It leads us to uncleanliness and iniquity to iniquity. Uncleanliness simply means, it means just messed up. It means there's something unclean that's there. Something that has plagued the entirety of the human race. Moral failure. Uncleanliness. When you think of something that is unclean, you think of something that's dirty. How many played sports? Don't raise your hand. If you played sports, you played football, you played baseball, you know what it's like to get dirty. When I played football as a little kid, they used to make fun of me because my my younger brother would come home and he would be covered from helmet to his cleats in dirt and mud and grass stains and everything else. They look at me, I got one little grass stain on my knee pad. I mean, I'm spotless. And they all laughed and said, what's the deal? And I said, I'm faster than everybody. I just outrun everybody. 
But when you look at something that's unclean, you look at something that's dirty. Sin dirties the life. Sin dirties the life of the unbeliever and the believer. It causes something to happen which has plagued the entirety of the human race from the fall until now. Sin brings the dirt out, so to speak. Sin is a dirty business. It brings from iniquity to iniquity. Now look at this. Uncleanliness and then leads to iniquity to iniquity. This means that sin never stays static. One sin leads to another. One sin then leads to another sin. Then it leads to another sin. Then it leads to another sin. Till you find yourself overwhelmed in sin. On a downward spiral. Sin always leads downward. It pulls you away from God. It separates you from God. Once again, look at what you used to be like. Look at how you used to live your life. And how that sin may have started it out innocently. But it went from innocent to something bigger. To something bigger. To something bigger to where you found yourself in a spider web of sin that you could not get out. Just the other day, I was outside with the girls, and we were playing, and man, here in Louisiana, it's all you see outside of spider webs. And in one of the little play things that the kids have that they hadn't played with since last summer because the weather, in one of the tire swings, there's nothing but a huge spider web. And there was something, an insect in that spider web that had trapped itself. And I saw it. Working its way and trying to free itself, but it couldn't. Sin is like quicksand. When you get into it, quicksand, the first instinct is to fight with all you can to get out. But the more you fight, the deeper you sink. Sin is the same way for the unbeliever and the believer. With the believer, the more you try to fight against this sin, the deeper in sin you go. The deeper you sink, the further you go down. It leads from uncleanliness to iniquity to iniquity. The second thing it leads to, the fruit of sin leads to iniquity, then it leads to slavery. It coincides. Starts out innocent, the next thing you know, you're in bondage. When you play with sin, you will get burned. It may start out just innocently once again. But you're going to find yourself in a bondage that you cannot free yourself from. How many times have we been there? Not just for the unbeliever, but for the believer. How many? I can think back in my mind when I was 20, 21 years of age, walking from my car when I was in college down to the, my dorm room and the weight of sin. And knowing that I, I, I didn't want to be this way, I didn't want to do it, but I struggled with it and I didn't know what else to do. I fought with everything that I could. And yet time and time again, I just wanted to wave the white flag of surrender and say, God, I quit. I can't do this. Sin leads to bondage. And Satan plays for keeps. He wants you enslaved. I know some of you think that I can handle this. No, you can't. You cannot handle sin. It's more powerful than we are. It's a greater force than what we can even muster. There's nothing that we can do to break the bonds of sin. Moses, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, that he, he chose to suffer the affliction of his people. 
than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Sin has a pleasure. It does have a pleasure, but you wake up one morning and it's not pleasurable anymore. It is a bondage that has gripped you that you can't shake it. Listen to me, young people. Satan will come at you ever so slightly. He will dangle that carrot. But once you reach for that carrot... He's trapped you. To trap an animal, they always have that box of some sort. And someone is lying in wait with that string attached to that little stick that's holding that box. And it's got that, 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 that piece of food that whatever it likes in it. And then when that animal, he just goes around it and looks at it and sniffs it. And after a while of looking at it, he realizes that's good food. He goes inside, and once he goes inside and to take up that bite, that poacher yanks that cord, and it's trapped that animal. That's what Satan does. He lies in wait. He holds that, food, that piece of food right out there that when we look at it and we reach for it, he yanks it, the cord, and he traps us. Don't think that you can ever outmaneuver Satan. You can't. Sin leads from one iniquity to another, then it leads to bondage, then next it leads to shame. The fruit of sin leads to shame. I don't have to talk much about that, because every one of us have been there. Sin makes a fool out of us. Unfortunately, it makes a fool out of us. It makes a fool out of you and out of me. There's nothing outside of that. There, there, there's no good that can come out of living a life of sin. Shame and disgrace is the end result. Destruction. And then the fruit of sin leads to death. Separation from God. And I don't mean just physical death. I mean spiritual death. The wages... Of sin is death. Sin pays, but it pays in death. And I'm speaking for the believer as well. I'm speaking at the un for the unbeliever and to the believer. You can see the progress here. It starts out small, then leads from uncleanliness to iniquity, then to iniquity, to slavery, to shame. Than death. But thank God he didn't leave us in that condition. Because Paul said, but now. But now. What you used to be, that's what it led to. But now. Due to one thing. Due to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, him crucified. Due to that one completed work, you can say, but now you have the fruit of holiness. The fruit of righteousness, which leads to holiness and righteousness. You go from iniquity to holiness. Boy, you, 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 do you get this? You go from iniquity to holiness. You go from sin to righteousness. You go from death to life. You get what I'm saying here tonight? Glory to God. Holiness. Holy living. And holy living is not about you wearing makeup or not. Holy living is not about what kind of clothes you wear or don't wear. Ladies, holiness is not meant, I hate to burst some of your bubbles here watching, but holiness is not the length of the dress. Because as someone once said, and rightfully so, and listen to me now, that long dress can come off as quickly as the short one. Come on now. Be honest. That long dress can come off just as quickly as the short one. And guys, you ain't no better. 
Come on now. Holiness is not about what you do. Holiness is about what has already been done working in your life through faith. Holiness is about faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit making you holy. We can't make ourselves holy. There's nothing that I can do. My brother up here, stand up real quick. My brother in the red shirt. There's nothing that my brother can do here to make himself holy. But there is one thing that God can do, stay standing, that can make him holy. That is him just evidencing faith in Christ, who he is and what he's done. Then the Holy Ghost comes in and says, I'm going to clean you up. I can't. I'm going to clean you up myself. I'm going to make you holy. Thank you, bud. Holiness. The fruit of holiness, the fruit of righteousness leads to holiness. And thank God for that. Holiness is the complete opposite of iniquity and uncleanliness. Whereas uncleanliness is dirty, holiness is spotless. Mm. You think about this. You traded your filthy garment and he gave you a robe of pure white. You traded your robe of uncleanliness, and he gave you a robe of holiness. How did it happen? Faith. 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 Not earning. Believing. Faith. But now. But now. I'm no longer in iniquity. But I've got a robe of righteousness and a robe of holiness. Glory to God. Secondly, I'm almost done. The second thing that righteousness, the fruit of righteousness leads to, number one is holiness. Secondly, is no longer a slave to sin, but being a slave unto God, a servant of Almighty God. Let me say something as I did a few weeks ago. Slave, the term slave has a negative connotation, and rightly so. But being a slave unto God is something altogether different. Altogether different. The Old Testament brings about it like this. In the Old Testament, if an individual was purchased by a family, they were made a servant. But yet they felt more freedom in the family than they did outside of the family. They felt secure in the family. And not outside the family. They felt respected in the family. They felt loved in the family. And not outside of the family. That that individual when it was given his time for freedom. Would take an awl which is like a spike. Put his ear up against the door and pierce his ear. Signifying that I'm staying here in this family forever. Likewise, when you got saved, you had freedom that you never had before in this family. You didn't have freedom on the family of Satan, but you've got freedom in the family of God. You've got love in the family of God. You've got security in the family of God. You've got peace and rest in the family of God. So likewise, I don't know about you, but I want to take that all, spiritually speaking. Pierce my ear, both ears at that, and say, Lord, I'm staying here forever. I'm not moving and I'm not leaving. Next, the fruit of righteousness. You see the contrast here? Iniquity. Holiness, slave to sin, servant of God. Mm, Okay, now. Shame. Hmm. To the third one, being made free from sin. Do you get this? Being made free from sin. Whereas the sin brings shame and disgrace. Being a Christian and understanding who you are in Christ, who he is and what he's done, brings about victory. You see, as the world, much of the world, has failed to take advantage of God's salvation plan. Which is simply, if they just believe, the sin debt can be removed. 
the unrighteousness can be cleansed and they can be brought into the family of God. Much of the church does not take advantage of God's victory plan. Come on now. As much of the world refuses to accept God's salvation plan, much of the church refuses to accept God's victory plan. It's all the same. It's all found in the same person. It's all found in the same event. Christ and what he did at Calvary's cross. I don't know about you, but I would rather, I would much rather live a life of freedom. Knowing that all I've got to do is just simply believe in who he is and what he's done. And the Holy Spirit begins to bring about the victory in my life through the power of Almighty God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Then suffering from sin and shame in the world. Do you? I do. There's so much better to living this life. Now, I'll admit it. This Christian life is not easy. I'll admit it that this Christian life has ups and downs. It has fastballs and curveballs that it throws at you that you don't understand. That you can't comprehend. It'll take you down and it will take you up. It'll take you on top of the mountain, and it will take you down into the valley. Life is unfair, and living for God at times can be unfair. But you know what? We've got it so much better than on the outside. Why? Because not only are our names written down in the Lamb's book of life, not only do we have a righteous robe put on, and we traded that unrighteousness for a righteous robe, not only do we trade, do we trade slavery to victory. Not only do we trade all of those negative things, but more importantly, we've traded death for life. Because now, before it was separation from God, but now, but now, at this moment, it's no longer separation from God, but it's clinging to God. You now have everlasting life. More abundant life and everlasting life. You're going to have a life either in hell or in heaven. The choice is up to us. All of our chances, young people, are on this side of the grave. Once we close our eyes... In this mortal life, and we end, we wind up, and wherever we wind up, that's it. There are, there, there's no going back. But tonight, you can have the fruit of sin, or you can say, but now. I have the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of holiness. The fruit of right living. The fruit of being a servant unto God. Are the fruit of being made free from all sin and the fruit of everlasting life. The choice is up to you. Stand your feet. Singer musicians, make your way back. We're closed down this chapter. We're going to begin our next time when we come before you on Romans chapter 7. And we're going to look at the believer's life and what happens to the believer once he begins to go away from faith in Christ and him crucified. And it's not a pretty picture. We're going to sing this simple song here before we dismiss here tonight. I want us just to slip up our hands all over this building. Whether watching by television, by radio, I want you to do the same thing. We're going to sing an old song. I asked my wife to sing it. Joseph's going to lead it. And as the singers and musicians are making their way back, it just simply says, there's victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. There is everlasting life in Jesus. There's rest in Jesus. There's peace in in Jesus. There's freedom from sin in Jesus. There is more abundant life in Jesus. As they sing it, go ahead, Joseph. Ooh, there's victory in Jesus. Let's just slip up our hands right now and just worship Him. Just thank Him for that victory. He sought me and He bought me. me there 
Before we dismiss, we're going to dismiss, and I just feel we're going to sing this song, put on the garment of praise just one more time. And I know it's going to change everything up a little bit, but I want us to leave here putting on the garment of praise, removing the spirit of heaviness. You may have come in here with a spirit of heaviness, but you're going to leave putting on the garments of praise. Go ahead, Joseph. The garment of praise. The spirit of heaviness. I hope and pray that you've enjoyed today's program, and I really believe it was a blessing to your heart and life. But before we close off and before we sign off for tonight's program, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell others about the Crossfire program. I want you to tell your young people, your young adults in your church to tune in every week to our Crossfire Youth Ministry services. And I know as what we are preaching, what we are giving to the people, it will be a blessing. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Gabriel Swaggart saying we'll see you next time in the Lord.